For the past few years, I've been doing a cultural arts engagement. Um, I don't know if I call it a program. It's just an opportunity for schools, for people who are interested in learning more about the cultural arts and kind of what I call the original arts of the land. Um, when I grew up, I found that you know the art that we were learning was more um, Western, and you know we didn't have a huge focus on the traditional arts that my my mom and my grandma were doing. So um, that just kind of became an interest for me to to try to help more people learn how to do cultural arts. So. Um, in my program, or my what what I offer schools is, uh, there's a lot of opportunities. I actually don't even know how to put it all together. So, um, I try not to be a one-off craft. I try not to be um, just come in and do a project with no history connection. So one of the things that I encourage is that um, before I go in to do actual hands-on art experiences, is that. Uh, we have a conversation about culture and how arts fits in culture, and not just First Nation culture, but all cultures in the world. Because um, you know, every culture in the world has their own forms of expression, and you know, the forms that we used a long time ago were the original ones here. So I mean, I like to tell people about that, um, and then I like to talk about how um, I go about collecting, preparing natural materials for a lot of the arts opportunities. So in a regular classroom setting, I can't do that at all within one class block. So um, I also think that when I do that talk beforehand and I kind of have a, I provide opportunity for the kids to experience like washing fish scales or dyeing porcupine quills that, um, you know, like what are we going to do next? You know, it kind of creates a, I guess, a, um, further inquiry like they would they're interested right instead of just kind of this is all your supplies and this is what we're going to make right so um, before I go and do any art I feel like that kind of stops it from being just a token craft or a token activity that we get to uh, learn more about um, even the relationship to the land because a lot of my material does come from the land that uh, as our our ancestors have always had a relationship with the land and we encourage to continue that so that's a neat part of, of my job is that uh, the connection to the land too um, and I get the kids to to um, just kind of experience that and you know know that that's what our ancestors did for you know thousands of years so I hope that kind of sums up what I do but um, I mean it's it's just natural to me to go and share and that's what our family does. When I first designed this cultural engagement um, that I go into schools with, my first audience was students. Um, so I'm a former employee of Edmonton Public Schools and one of the things that um, I had the opportunity to, to do was to pilot this, this project while I was there and uh, I found that it was easy to go into elementary schools because kids are just more excited for learning. Um, I just had this idea that old people were already set in their ways and that high school kids don't want to be involved, <laughs> just from experience, right? So um, I first designed it for elementary school and then from, from that, just going to different schools or different programs, um, offering it through teacher professional development and things like that, I learned about um, taking all of my my activities and making adaptations so you know okay so that all ages could do it so um, my original target was was elementary school but now that I found um, there's a huge demand for what I do there's a lot of people that are interested in, in bringing in cultural arts into the school whether it's because of all what's happening with reconciliation or learning about residential schools or people just trying to incorporate the history, the original history of Canada that, um, you know, there's a high demand for it. So then I started to play around with different um, different ways of, of delivering information. First, for simple topics, so for example, um, like porcupine quill work. 
Um, porcupines are, or the quills are dangerous, they're sharp, so right away, you know, you don't want little kids playing with it, but how could you create an opportunity for them to, to understand the concept of quill work? So, I mean, being able to do that, I've, um, you know, I've opened my audience a little, a little bit more. Um, and then there are places where I've been to quite a few times, you know, so I feel like maybe those quillers could be advanced by now, <laughs> but, um, they, uh, we can go into different variations of, of quill work. So, um, starting with basic understanding, um, you know, my my original audience was was elementary school, but now I deliver to early learning all the way through high school, um, including teachers and, and staff, um, staff PD um, retreats. So just to people who want to have a cool cultural arts experience but then it does teach a little bit um, a little bit of history and I try not to um, scare people off <laughs> you know try not to make it too hard um, make it uh, easy enough so that people can complete and have a have a cool experience for um, the original audience that I had developed this with like the pilot project in Edmonton um, it was really in my heart, <laughs> I wanted our, our First Nation, Métis, Inuit um, kids to see culture in the city, to find um, a sense of identity, because we know, we all know that when we have a strong sense of identity, we can pretty much tackle, tackle anything, but coming across a lot of young kids that, um, you know, might have grown up in the city, don't know their extended family in their whatever from whatever First Nation community they come from. Um, so, one of the beliefs that we always had at, at our at my place of employment was our halls, walls, and resources should re reflect our population. And the schools that had a high um, Indigenous population were kind of my. Um, they had a soft spot, like I have a soft spot in my heart for them because those are the kids that um, probably needed the most that connection to identity because you know you are First Nation um, when you are in a group of you know other people. Um, so whether that's a comfort in identifying yourself as okay, it's okay that I'm different because I am First Nation, but then what are those things that I can do that make strengthen me as a First Nation person? So um, a lot of my my projects, I hope that, you know, the children or the people that participate came out with a, with a stronger sense of identity, with um, a passion for exploring further into the arts. Um, you know, a long time ago, I was taught that, you know, our, our, our forms of expression, our arts are tools, they're not just um, for economic <laughs> or f to make money, they are, they are ways to help your, your mind and and your heart it's storytelling so it takes care of our health and well-being and that's kind of what I would would wish my um, participants come out with is um, recognizing that it's it's helpful not it's not just something to do that um, the more you do it you know it could be calming it could be relaxing it could be um, kind of your own therapy but um, you know it's uh, it's pretty powerful when you can do storytelling in many different um, um, ways so that's kind of what I hope for for a lot of people that experience the cultural arts with me especially the kids um, but you know when I target the teachers I hope it's something that they can take into the classroom so that the kids can see themselves in the classroom because that's where they come from that's their own history um, so I guess another thing that that I want people to understand is um, I got to travel all over the world um, I'm a volleyball player so I got to go um, all over Canada, played in the United States, I even got to go to Europe, but I found a lot of times I was defending stereotypes or I guess breaking myths about, about us and it just kind of became my, my line of work, I guess, is trying to help people understand rather than getting mad at, um, you know, that they don't know the real us and, you know, we have our own ways of, of doing, being. So creating that understanding for all people is that, um, I mean, in my heart, I kind of think it will eliminate racism one day, the, the kinds of conversations that I have, because um, when I parallel cultures, you know, we're not all different, we're actually kind of 
the same. It's just that those tiny elements that make us unique are, are different. And um, creating understanding is kind of, I guess, the overall objective. But um, yeah, I, my heart is with the kids because as adults, we can design programs. We can um, say, hey, these are cool. These are going to work. But if the kids don't love it, they're not going to gravitate towards it. And they're not going to just naturally want to do it all the time. So um, I'm scared that culture is going to be come too much of just a subject one day that uh, we can just um, hey, have this experience and you know they fall in love with it and want to learn more so so when I go into school usually before I go I offer the variety of, of topics that I like to go in with and like I said I like to have a conversation to start with so the first conversation I like to have is about culture in general. Um, all cultures in the world have common elements and for someone that um, you know comes from culture it's easy to say oh in your culture this is what you do, in my culture this is what we do. You know, So we do paralleling instead of just pointing out the differences. So um, for me that, that cultural conversation is the most important thing that I take into the schools as it um, is a, a conversation that I can say, you know, when we learn about a, an art project, you know, we can go back to all those common elements and see how it fits. Um, so that's the first conversation I go into. I, I call it like an introduction to culture. It, um, it has those common elements that I can, can, I guess, refer back to when, we, when I do the cultural arts. Um, Another thing that I like to go into the schools with is talking about uh, traditional foods. So my mom is uh, Lorraine Yuzichpi and she has been doing traditional foods presentations my whole life. I don't remember a time if she ever didn't do presentations, but um, she liked to talk about how um, we can harvest the food from our own land, from our community, um, that it's a healthier way of, of living. So being able to have that conversation with kids um, create an experience. So when I go into a classroom and do the cultural or traditional foods presentation, um, I take in little samples of all the food that we collect from Standing Buffalo and then um, we make a version, what I call grocery store pemmican, but it's just because all the food comes from the grocery store. So it's one of my popular ones. A lot of people like doing that one. It's simple, it's fun, it's delicious. <laughs> um, one of the other kinds of stuff I go in with, I guess uh, another topic is uh, traditional games. So I know there's a lot of traditional games workshops and stuff that people go to, but when I do my presentation on games, I like to talk about how um, there's different stages of learning in there and helping kids recognize that they're actually learning instead of just playing a game. Um, I feel that, uh, you know, the traditional games uh, equipment because it's made of natural materials I can talk about the relationship to the land again um, I can talk about um, you know when we're done playing with it we can give it back to Mother Earth it'll turn back into Earth so those kinds of things but um, recognizing the different stages in games and sometimes we don't even know we're we're playing a game um, and learning at the same time so um, kids find it awesome when they, they realize that they can learn through game and then sometimes I get the I wish we could play games all the time to learn instead of doing schoolwork. So um, that's another one of my favorites. Um, so those are the kind of two, I wouldn't say artsy, but um, the rest of them are um, more project focused. So I like working with natural materials. So the most requested one right now is uh, porcupine quill work. So. Um, there are places where I have done um, done a, a visit where the kids actually wash, clean, and dye porcupine quills before they use them, which is, uh, I think, a real thorough experience, right? Like, they get to do that. Otherwise, <laughs> people that don't do that, I just come in with colored quills already, so they don't get to see that process. Um, so there's other materials that I dye. I also dye horse hair, moose hair, fish scales. Um, the porcupine quills um, and caribou hair because they teach all kinds of, of cultural arts and one of the things through doing the natural material collection and washing and prep and dye um, 
I talk about how you know different groups of, of indigenous people you know might not have used all these materials but uh, you know we all have that common relationship with the land and a lot of our things are are harvested the same way and um, yeah so with the cultural arts um, I like to talk about well teaching quill work um, bead work we're known like, you know we're known for our bead work but a lot of times people don't recognize that our beadwork actually evolved from quill work. So a lot of our beading techniques are old quill work techniques. So having kids, you know, realize that, you know, like, oh okay, you know, I get it. You know, those are kind of those those things that I like, you know, like, oh, that makes sense, right? So um, I like working with leather. So a lot of times when we do um, a lot of our art I will use leather. I feel like it, I can say that's the original canvas of the land. And um, so a lot of our painting, a lot of the hair embroidery um, will go on leather. Working with parflesh, you know, parflesh is actually uh, a French word, but um, the rawhide, the rawhide component of making like containers and things like that, uh, the kids can make a little envelope. Uh, depending on the, the time I have, some people have made boxes or other kinds of containers which involve math, you know, which a lot of people don't realize too, like the the already components of, of that exist from school, you know, the science in it, the math and it, the literacy, the numeracy, like all that kind of stuff. Um, we can pull a lot of that from these cultural arts and, and find ways of, of enhancing those those elements, I guess. But um, you know, it's fun fun when we can do it in, from a arts perspective. Um, so a lot of the arts that I do go in with, it's really, I, I like to teach the technique so that kids learn to apply the technique rather than assume that the technique is only for that project. So um, when I do quill work, I will teach quill wrapping and sewing down the quill in three different versions. So instead of just making a project, so then they apply the technique to the project, which I think is more freeing, more liberating in a way, there's uh, room for creativity, whereas if you go in with a project that already has, you know, its limits, um, it's not as fun. Uh, same with beading, I go in with just a beading technique, I go in with three beading techniques and then the kids get to create something on their own, so um, I think having that flexibility is really important. Um, so I've also done collaborations with other kinds of, of art, so for example, um, this one time I had a junior high art project where our theme was uh, reconciliation and the calls to action. So I've taken the, the three days that we work with the kids and broke it down into um, learning about those calls to action, reconciliation, having those pre-conversations, then learning art techniques, and then watching the kids come up with um, an art piece influenced by the calls to action. So whatever call to action spoke to them the most, um, or one that they wanted to focus on, whether it was um, a call to action that was important to their family or in the direction they were going, if they wanted to be in the health field or in education. Um, so they picked, picked one call to action to portray into art. So um, I have one school right now that applied to do all the 94 calls to action into an art piece. So hopefully we get the grant, but um, yeah, it's creating, it's, it's creating opportunities like that that I love to, you know, go into places and talk about. We don't have to follow this agenda, you know, all the topics that I send out, but that we can also come up with our own with our own version. Um, last year, I worked at Belcaris School and we did a piece on um, dedicated to the missing and murdered Indigenous women of Canada, and so the kids did some research and they found um, information that, you know, it told us all the locations of the documented cases of missing missing women and then so our art piece it was funny because our art piece it was a leather and we strung it up like on a high tanning frame and then we did an image transfer of all the provinces across Canada but when I brought the leather it was already in the shape of Canada so I thought that was really like it was meant to be kind of thing. So, um, and then when we did that, the kids learned how to do, um, we just did a quick daisy chain, like a daisy flower. 
So they made these little flowers and documented all the locations on that hide uh, where the missing cases were. Um, so for them to go through that realization, you know, that these are real people, that they had to look up a name and to see where they went missing from, then to find that on the map, but then to document it in a way, you know, like the, the cultural arts on the leather with the beads um, and the flowers, you know, the flowers being connected to the environment and the land. Um, it was really, it was a really powerful experience because not only was it the kids, you know, when, when people would walk by, they're like, oh, what are you up to? So there's, it, it invited a lot of people into the, to the classroom, which also um, created more opportunities for the conversation for missing and murdered Indigenous women. But, um, you know, one, that's probably one of the, one of my favorite um, things that I've, I've done in the classroom. But uh, I like to design things because teachers, schools, I mean, the audience that I go to, whoever I coordinate with knows their, their people the best. So um, I'm always willing to design something, whether it's unique, whether it's something that I've done already. Um, but to create an experience that, you know, that they're going to have conversations about for a long time. Um, and then lead into other conversations. Last week, um, sitting in the kindergarten class after I've been there quite a few, you're like, what are we going to do next? You know, it's the people that want more. Um, that's... That's kind of what I go, like, there is a huge need for it, um, but when I see kids finish a project, when I see kids bring things to parallel, the significance of it, you know, that's, uh, that's what it, then they get it, right? Like, I feel like they get it, um, but when it comes to kids, it's just the, the fact that they made something, um, so I'll give you an example, one of my, um, schools that I did, we did a doll project where the kids all made dolls, right? So um, we started from scratch and we just had leather and we stuffed them and then the kids designed clothes. Um, and to hear stories a year later where the kids still carry their dolls or see pictures on Facebook of those kids with those dolls. Um, and I guess the, the stories that come from the parents too, you know, like I thankful for parents that reach out to say, hey, this actually meant something to my child, you know, and um, I guess it's just mostly the feedback. I'm, I'm not, I have this thing about, I know education, you know, they, they give grades and things like that, but I feel like when it comes to things that have to do with identity, maybe we shouldn't do that. <laughs> um, that, uh, how can we really measure, like, oh, you are doing 70% in learning your language, you know, like whether, what does that say, you know, about how we're maybe not influencing this person to just learn, right? So I get scared that if my, I hope my arts and my opportunities never turn into to a child receiving a grade because I'm hoping that it influences, um, you know, their identity, um, their sense of self. So, um, that's one thing I'm always scared of, the success. I, I don't really depend on, on grading or I don't have a criteria. Mine is just as long as they try and they get to hear the stories of the connection to culture, the connection to the land, um, a little bit of history of how we got to this place from doing these arts a long time ago to now. Like for me, that's enough for, for them to, to know and to learn and um, I can't force them to, to do more art or to like it, but... Um, I don't know if I have any real success measurement, but um, I guess the stories, the feedback, the demand, um, the desire, like a lot of people want to want to have this in their school, want to have their students experience it. Um, and it's it's time for, for us to do that. <laughs> We're gonna help people. So. Well, the other thing is there's a lot of, there's not a lot of funding out there for um, artists to go into schools, um, people, Schools have to find ways, um, so I've had schools that apply for grants through Saskar Sports. So last year we got three grants. Um, this year I had seven schools apply, you know, for the November first deadline. So for it to go up from like more than double, right? So um, the 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 desire for it is there, um, but I think if it was any other kind of opportunity, like. Um, 
you know, field trips and stuff like that, there'd be money, but um, because it's unique, it's it's hard for schools to, to get me to come in. And whereas when I was in Edmonton, because it was my job, <laughs> it was easy for me to go into schools. I had my budget and it was no at no cost to schools, right? So, but now it's a cost to schools because, um, well, I'm not a paid employee. Um, the nobody has all the the materials that I use, so um, to to have that supplies on hand and um, people want it, but yeah, I'm just the interest. I guess is my the interest for it would probably be my measurement. It's since I've come home, there's a lot of people that wanna wanna invite me to their school. first moved back to Saskatchewan, I found that it was a... Uh, because people didn't know what I what I did, I was in an area where nobody experienced what I do in the schools, that it was almost kind of like a hard sell. Um, I felt like I had to convince people a lot more in the beginning, whereas now I just, you know, I get emails or phone calls and asking my availability. But um, the hardest... Well, not the hardest part, but I mean, I don't see it as a barrier, but because I've been doing this for a long time, um, my back, my educational background, I actually am not a teacher. I don't have a B.Ed. Um, I went to school to be a welder. I wanted to do, I wanted to be a welding artist. I wanted to do metal sculptures. And um, I also did a cultural arts instructor program, which, you know, I learned a lot about the arts in the North. Um, so when I... When I tell people that I'm not a teacher, I feel like they look at me like I have less, um, oh, you know, like I'm, I don't know, I just feel like, okay, I don't qualify to be here, but then at the same time, I I can see the that the there is a lack of cultural arts knowledge and ways of incorporating cultural arts in the classroom. So for me, that's my strength. And luckily, when I did work with Edmonton Public, you know, um, the my supervisor and my co coworkers, you know, there was a lot of collaboration. So um, when we when I designed this this program, um, you know, I got to go into the schools and uh, you know those teacher colleagues that I had, you know, helped me, and we basically just kind of. I think because they were open to it, right? It didn't, it didn't. To them, it didn't matter if I was a teacher or not. It was the my abilities of being able to go into the classroom to create these opportunities for, for kids. Um, so coming home and trying to tell people, you know, this is what I do, and um, to not be an actual teacher. It's, I don't want to call it a barrier because I don't. I mean, I don't see a need for it for myself um, because I love doing this and. Um, it's not a huge criteria for myself to, <laughs> to do. It's a passion. It's something that I already know. So, um, yeah, going into the classrooms is just natural anyways. You know, my whole life everybody said that I should be a teacher, but I didn't want to be a teacher. <laughs> I don't want to teach people stuff that they might not like, you know, so I'd rather create cool experiences for people. Um, so, yeah, when I first came back, it was a hard sell. But now, now that people know what I do, um, yeah, like I, I think I like that the, that I don't have to work every day, <laughs> you know, I don't have to uh, be busy all the time and I can be free for, for a lot of things, like, um, when I worked with Edmonton Public, I had a lot of requests for outside the district, whereas I'm a district employee, so it was really hard to, to say, I want to help them, but, you know, I can't because my job limits me, you know, I have my area, I have my school. So um, now that I'm just doing independent contracting, then um, it's easy. Like I travel all over the place and it's awesome. So I don't feel like I'm missing out on kids. Whereas when I was in my other job, um, I felt like, oh, I only have these kids, but these kids need it too. So just being free, I feel like uh, it, it's better. But yeah, that was the only, it's, yeah. I'm in the momentum now. The challenges aren't really there, so. think of um, my ancestors, you know, are 
our method of nurturing a child to have um, the abilities and skills that they need to be contrib contributing to, to um, society, I guess. Um, you know, when I think of our, our those old ways, um, I feel that's more truest to, to Indigenous education rather than the, the Western way. Um, the ways of doing that is also different as we didn't have classrooms. Um, no authoritative figures, I guess, in, in, um, in the groups. But, you know, from going into classrooms now, I find that uh, the whole idea of culture in the school can be a little more specific to, um, to be a little more specific to, to the truest cultures of, of the land here. So um, when I have that conversation of culture in the classroom, um, I, I talk about six common elements. The first element is language. The second one is kinship. The third one is the process in transferring of traditional knowledge. The fourth one is the connection to the environment. The fifth one is the ceremonies and celebrations. And then the last one is the forms of expression. So part of the reason I teach people or I tell people about those six common elements, and these elements kind of came after attending multiple kinds of cultural awareness um, trainings, um, other kinds of events where people were trying to talk about, um, you know, indigenous culture. But uh, for me, working in such a diverse area in Edmonton, I found that, okay, these are things that everybody will understand, not just uh, indigenous people, but all cultures in the world. So paralleling those conversations so that we have um, common, um, common elements of, of culture was, um, I find it more comforting rather than just always finding out a difference and then you have to know those differences. So when I think of Indigenous education, I hope that um, I don't sound like I'm bashing Western education, but you know, there's, when it comes to language, there's, uh, we're not all on the same page when it comes to language. There's formal communication and we learn how to read and write, um, then formatting and things like that. Whereas there's more of a feeling and, and consideration and compassion and empathy when we communicate in person, which is more true to culture, um, as when we transfer traditional knowledge, you know, they're not giving us tests, they're not giving us assignments or, or things like that. So in how we communicate with one another, I feel like that's kind of, um, there's a difference in that. So um, the culture, the cultural component for language and communication, um, I feel it's more person um, not person, more, I don't know, empathetic when we, when we do it in person. Um, so the kinship system, so in, the, in, in our families, you know, we have all of our cousins, which are like our brothers and sisters, right? So um, we don't have a kinship system in regular education. We understand people's jobs, roles, and responsibilities, but um, in, in a family, you learn from people. So growing up, I was able to go and live with, you know, my auntie or a couple of my aunties because I have a lot. Um, and they all had different things to teach me. But in my culture, I understood that um, they might have things that uh, my mom doesn't um, see it their way or, you know, but it's still helpful to me. And then that's why she sent me because, you know, there's things that I could do and learn from, from other people. And when I think of a classroom setting for to be able to go and learn from other people that's not really the, the flex, there's no flexibility in that and you know there's one teacher responsible for all of these things um, so when I when my mom sent me to well not sent me I sounded like she's uh, forcing me away but you know I had opportunities to go stay with with other people and um, that was for for me you know like she knew that it would strengthen me or mentor me into my own strengths and abilities which um which I feel like, yeah, this is this is how I would love to learn, is to go and spend time with people that will help me. And when you think of a family structure, that's kind of our role and our job is to um, is to help that way. And compared to a classroom setting or in, in, in education, you know, you're kind of on your own and you um, might not have that relationship with people that are 
they're doing the same thing, right? So um, when I think of how we transfer traditional knowledge, um, our format in Western way is really you have uh, your teacher who's kind of giving the instruction and you sit behind a desk or at a table. Um, and I was taught our traditional way of learning, you're kind of, you're spending time with the person. There's no barriers in between you. Um, and you're, you're learning hands-on and they're not going to say, you know, here's your assignment and come and show me afterwards and give me a mark kind of thing. I know I was already talking about that, but um, even being able to ask for information, you know, we're told that, okay, it's time for science, it's time for math, whereas if I were to go and seek traditional knowledge, I make that choice and I'm going to take that tobacco and I'm going to offer it. I know what I'm getting into because I'm seeking that information. So being able to apply that transfer of traditional knowledge process, I feel more connected to to our Indigenous ways or to our, our culture. Um, so just acknowledging that, that you're going to go and learn something, that you're making an effort, you're taking that offering, I feel like, our, because our kids don't do that for all the other subject things, maybe there's a little bit of a disconnect, but... Um, when I think of the, the thanking, you know, when you're done, when you're learning, when you've learned what you needed to learn and you have that opportunity to say thank you or to give a gift, you know, what we gift people when they give us their time and their knowledge, um, you know, that it feels like it comes full circle, right, that you got what you needed so they, that you can say thank you in, in a good way and, and give that gift and, you know, teachers don't often receive that from students, right? Like, um, an example I always give in school is like, have you guys ever taught your teachers that thank you for teaching me about math, you know, I'm gonna be smarter with money when I grow up, you know, those kinds of things, but you know, it's not part of our process to teach kids to be thankful for what they're learning in the classroom. Um, so when I think of indigenous education in that perspective, you know, like I think there could be a lot more um, um, relationship that way, you know, like talking in a full process of acknowledging what you're getting and then being thankful for, for it afterwards. Um, when it comes to connection to the environment, you know, every culture is connected to the environment and there's so much information in there and uh, I think of my arts process, you know, I have to collect, wash, clean, dye stuff and you know I don't just go hunting for art supplies you know we have a, a relationship with the land and how we use it um, even when it's the food that I eat the lunch that I have the water that we get um, all comes from the land so when I was growing up in school well so I went to school in my community I also went to school in town and then I went to residential school so when I think of the connection to the land and the environment, um, I didn't have that when I went to school and to public school because um, I felt like because we had more activities that are at residential school and at home that were connected to First Nation, to our culture, that um, I felt that relationship was there. But I didn't feel when I was in public school. And sometimes I worry that when I go into public school is that, um, you know, that connection to the environment um, is not identified or pointed out to, to kids as much as it was when, when I was in a, a school in my community and residential school. So, I mean, I keep in mind my own experiences when I go into schools, but, um, you know, I, I really believe that uh, the environmental connection is really important because um, our food, how we behave on the land, where, where our buildings are, um, what our buildings what comes around our buildings, I guess. And I remind kids, you know, we are, even though we have our, we talk about our own traditional territories, that, um, you know, plants, animals have traditional territories in the cities that we live in or are part of, they, if we removed it all, you know, there would have been plants and animals that lived here too. So um, I feel like that environmental connection just really acknowledges this, this space of where people are learning even though we're in a building, that uh, we could acknowledge that uh, there was animals and plants that whose natural home was here.
the ceremonies and celebrations, you know, when, when it comes to education, we celebrate, you know, where they're, fa- they're, they're finishing school, they're graduating, um, there's all the, your, like, the Western holidays that we celebrate in, in education, right, in a school. We participate in Valentine's Day, St. Patrick's Day, um, you know, but none of those are original to, to this land or come from our people. And the things that we do celebrate are kind of um, past tense, if you will. So when I think of graduation, it means you've completed what you needed to, to do to get to a certain point. Um, but a long time ago, our life celebrations were your inability to do things, right? So when you became a provider, that's when you were an adult. It said you could do all these things, you have these abilities. Um, so we don't really... When I think of our own celebrations and things that we, we could encourage people to be more, um, I guess it's a different, in a different way, like, our celebrations, our ceremonies in a school aren't rooted, I guess, in the culture, so that's one thing that bothers me. So when I think of education that way, I mean, I would love to see that uh, we celebrate, um, like coming of age type of things rather than just birthdays um, that we celebrate events that are going to teach us more about the land or the time of the year watching the stars and things like that instead of Christmas and New Year's and which are just done by a calendar system um, and then the last part I guess the forms of expression and that's kind of what I like to focus on and that's the art the art piece. We always learn about other people, famous people, um, in art history, and we don't focus teaching the kids about the original art forms from, from where they live. And I feel like with a lot of our families that didn't get to grow up with culture, whether it's because of residential schools or not, um, the strength and identity and knowing those things um, can be very powerful. And um, I'll just give you an example. So this one time I did a did a, a art project and um, had some non First Nation kids just kind of looking and watching and um, you know for them to be curious about what I was doing with our First Nation Métis and Inuit students. Uh, I felt like well, what, what can they share to, that parallels with that, right? Like, for the First Nation kids, we have that relationship to the land, to this land here, and for that non-First Nation person, you know, where's their, where, what is that for them? And knowing that that's something that they're looking for too. Um, you know, so when I think of the whole arts part in, in education, I like to... I like to pro- promote ours as a, as a tool um, to take care of our health and well-being. It's about the journey you go on, not about what your art looks like. And, you know, when I think of the school projects that they have to learn about art, you know, all the projects look the same. And it's because of something that already exists. It's about um, copying somebody's style, whereas in our history, you know, it was your, your own storyteller, these... these we didn't have, you know, logos, labels, or universal symbols, you know, those kinds of things, because all of our, our decorating came from, from us as an individual. So using the arts to promote people to be still an individual instead of being lumped together, um, copying somebody or, or doing a project that everybody's doing the same thing, For art, like this, it's important to be, I guess, separate. One of the things that I recognize is that we're all not taught a method in organizing cultural content. We're, we learn of other cultures and we, we do it by, by element, by element, by element. Instead of saying, oh, these elements are the same. Um, so I feel I would love to see that all people will would learn how to organize cultural information. So, um, for example, when 
when we teach other people, we can say, oh, this is a ceremony, this is a ceremony, this is a ceremony. So instead of them having to remember all those ceremonies, they could just kind of put it in a ceremony category and then learn something new, right? So um, even in our own people, I feel like we're overwhelmed with, you know, culture coming back and, you know, we have to learn all these things, but we need to sort it out and have a, have a look back take a step back and see if we could see how it all fits together but nobody really teaches us how it all fits together they just say this is kind of what happens here this is how this happens this is how you do this so um, just the, the process and being able to step back to look at it to, to deconstruct it a little bit to see how um, you could see that it fits in, in culture so a process like that to, you know would be really neat um, the other thing that I would love um, if I see like down down the road is um, I was taught that when you are learning your mind your body and your spirit have to be present and so in Alberta we show this resource it's a it's a little video clip and it's about um, this guy he tells a story of how a young boy ran away from residential school and when he got home, the elders asked him, why did you run away? Because school is supposed to be good for you. And he told them, they're only teaching me with my mind. So when I do my cultural arts, like the PD stuff, I ask the teachers, you know, when you look at your lesson plans, when you look at your opportunities that you're, you're providing or creating for students, how many of them actually consider the body, the mind, and the spirit of the children? And when I think of how I like to get people excited, you know, before I actually do things. Um, you know, that's almost like you're inviting the spirit to be there. Um, so when in our spirituality, you know, we can, we call on our ancestors, we call for people to be there. And um, we're not always all present when we go to something. Like I know I've been to meetings where like, oh, my mind and my body want to be at home sleeping, <laughs> right? And when I'm in the classroom, you know, sometimes kids, they might be tired or hungry, so their spirit isn't there. They're maybe waiting for lunchtime, or they want to go back to the game at recess, you know. So not all elements are present when we are learning. So to have our educators learn on how to, to do that for each class, or maybe down the road, you know, or our education system will change, maybe we won't have subjects, like, is it Finland, I think, doesn't have um, subjects anymore, but, uh, you know, that learning to, to acknowledge and recognize when your students' body, mind, and spirit are present, that a lot of things will, will, will stick, but, um, you know, right now our, our classrooms, you know, this is, uh, these are the outcomes we have to reach, and here we're going to try to, try to, try to get that, and, um, I find that when, you recognize maybe in the favorite subjects like gym and and art the kids are excited that means that you know their spirit is present their their mind is ready and, and it's fun their the setup is usually different they're not in a desk they're not behind there's no barrier in between the lesson and the learning so um, those are probably the two most uh, important things that I would like to see would be the the ability to to deconstruct culture, to take a step back and then kind of make it into categories so that it, it, it makes sense. And then to make sure that, you know, our children's body, mind, and spirit are present in, in learning. We're just all people, I guess, because when I think of when I used to go to school here, you know, there's a lot of people that were looking for um, strength and identity, you know. They're like, I didn't grow up with culture and I came to learn, you know, and using the, the elements of the university, you know, which, you know, they, they have a lot of opportunities for your spirit to grow and, you know, we should have that all along in our lifetime. So, um, and I know a lot of our own people, our Indigenous people need that, but, you know, for all Canadians to recognize that would be kind of awesome, you know, that it's that it becomes common, common part of education that we, we, um, we teach others to be compassionate, compassionate, have empathy, um, 
you know, I already see a difference in, in, in kids from just from the work that I do, you know, when I do presentations to different groups, um, you know, talking to the older people who didn't grow up with um, cultural information or weren't aware of, of just history of Indigenous people in general, to, you know, high school kids that have a lot of experience and they're learning more about it. So, like, I can see the change in, in understanding history, so I think the same could happen for understanding culture. Um, which I feel like is a huge element of, of education because it's, it groups us together as a people having um, the same values. So one of the things I always tell people about is um, when George Erasmus talked about how where common memory is lacking, there can be no um, community. So when I think of, well, we need to create all these common awesome memories so that a lot of people can be part of a huge, like a greater community, um, and it starts. I think that starts with education. It starts with educating people um, with with the same experiences and and powerful powerful opportunities. I guess um, then those powerful opportunities become the common elements and common memories of, of everyone. So.